the top 10 cancelled American bombers. From comically inept aeroplanes designed by overconfident charlatans to nuclear capable supersonic bombers that would have been all too effective in delivering doomsday, the US has created an exceptionally exciting armada of almost bombers. It's possible to appreciate these incredible machines without the stench of infamy that accompanies many operational bombers. Here are just some of them. Douglas XB-42, Mixmaster, Mixmaster Flash. The remarkable XB-42 was in many ways the most advanced piston-engined warplane ever flown, though the Republic Rainbow might be a rival for this title. As René J. Francillon put it, The XB-42 was as fast as a Mosquito B-16, but carried twice the maximum bomb load. Furthermore, the Mixmaster had a defensive armament of four 50 cal machine gun in two remote control turrets, whereas the Mosquito B-16 was unarmed. A variety of offensive gun options were considered, including 16 50 cals or two 37mm cannon. The XB-42A had a top speed of 488 miles per hour and a maximum range of 4,750 miles. The Mixmaster was superb, but by the time the war ended, the USAAF could afford to wait for the inevitable arrival of the jet bomber. The Mixmaster offers a tantalising insight into how military aircraft may have evolved if the piston age had lasted a little longer. Convair YB-60 the peacetaker. In the early 1950s, the US Air Force wanted a turbojet-powered, heavy strategic bomber. Convair had built the piston engine B-36 for the Air Force and decided simply swapping out the B-36's prop motors for jets, among other modest changes, would suffice to prevent miles per hour while lugging 36 tonnes of bombs. Impressive but not as impressive as the performance of the YB-60's most direct competitor. Boeing's B-52. The eight-engine B-52 cruises at 525 miles per hour, over a distance of 4,500 miles, while carrying 35 tonnes of bombs. The Air Force cancelled the YB-60's test programme in January. Rockwell B-1A chucking Excalibur back in the lake. Jump 20 years and the United States Air Force continued its morbid fixation with being able to obliterate the Soviet Union and incinerate its citizens with nuclear weapons. But its primary nuclear bomber, the B-52, was increasingly vulnerable to modern air defences. The proposed replacement for the B-52 strategic bomber was more than twice as fast, capable of Mach 2.2, higher than twice the speed of sound at higher altitudes. To penetrate Soviet air defences, it would rely on speed, a massively complicated, powerful, electronic countermeasure suite and a reduced radar cross-section. It was, in fact, the first combat aircraft to be designed from the start with a degree of radar stealth. The incredibly sleek machine, complete with variable geometry or swing wings, first flew in 1974. It had suffered a slow development, having to fight its corner with many sceptics believing long-ranged strategic missiles were a better solution to manned aircraft. Problems continued. Its onboard defensive systems were problematic and costs were spiralling. Would it not be easier just to use standoff cruise missiles launched from faraway B-52s than to throw money at this difficult project? Meanwhile, truly stealthy aircraft were being developed in secret. With this in mind, the B-1A was axed, but would later be reborn as the far slower and enormously maintenance-heavy B-1B. 
As of today, the ancient B-52 is still in service, whereas the retirement process of the far younger B-1B has already begun. Whitman Lewis XNBL-1, Barlin Bomber. Mitchell's Folly. The US military has a surplus of bile and much of this is expressed through inter-service rivalry. The lamentable Barling bomber benefited from this domestic squabbling thanks to the cantankerous persistence of William Billy Lendrum Mitchell. Mitchell was an army general who had led US air combat operations in World War I. He was an ardent believer in air power and in particular the ability of bombers to destroy battleships. This latter belief was heresy to the US Navy and threatened the dogma that destroyers were unstoppable and more seriously threatened to divert funds from the Navy to the Army. While the US Navy commissioned a series of secret tests to prove destroyers couldn't be sunk by aeroplanes, Mitchell worked on some demonstrations to prove the opposite. Mitchell used Martin NBS-1 short-range bombers for these tests, but clearly a large aircraft with an exceptional range would be better for the mission. Mitchell enlisted the help of the worst aircraft designer, this side of Dr. William Whitney Christmas. Walter Barling, creator of the catastrophic Tarrant Tabor. Barling seemed to believe that the best way to improve on the extremely large design disaster that was the Tabor was to make it even bigger. The result was the largest aircraft in the world, a triplane with a wingspan seven metres greater than that of the Avro Vulcan. Not bad for 1923. In almost every metric, it was pitiful, painfully slow, way shorter range than the short range NBS-1 and underpowered and with more parasitical drag than St Pancras Station. Conceptually, it laid the way for the later strategic bombers and with them the hundreds of thousands of dead civilians of Dresden, Tokyo, Nagasaki and the dozens of other targets that have suffered their devastating wrath. Douglas XB-43, Jetmaster. Jetmaster not so flash. The XB-43 was the first American jet bomber to fly. It came three years after the world's first operational jet bomber, the German Arado AR-234. If the XB-43 looks familiar, it's because you have seen it in its earlier life as the piston-engined Mixmaster. With its unswept flying surfaces and chunky fuselage, it was an awkward halfway house between the piston and jet age and was pushed aside by the superior North American B-45 tornado. Martin XB-51. No cigar for the silver cigar. Blessed with one of the most exotic configurations of a wildly imaginative crop of experimental bombers from various manufacturers, the XB-51 was frankly a bit of a dud. Originally designed as a low-level bombing and close support aircraft, it wound up being considered instead as one of the options to replace the B-26 Invader as a night tactical bomber alongside the North American B-45 AJ-1 Savage and the English Electric Canberra. The XB-51 featured an engine installation unlike any other. It's too slow. The competition came down to a fly-off against the Canberra, which had created a sensation by flying non-stop and unrefueled to the US from Europe, the first jet aircraft to do this. In the fly-off, the XB-51 lost out to the Canberra, which could exceed the ceiling required by 15,000 feet and offer double the required range, although slightly faster at low level, the relatively high wing loading and low fuel capacity of the XB-51 meant that it lost out to the Canberra in range, ceiling and payload, despite appearing a far more futuristic design. Martin XB-68, steel eye wingspan. <laughs> That's such a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping that in. No! You're saying these little things are funny. No, you can't. Like you laughing and taking the piss out of the script is quite nice. Okay. St uh, okay. 
Are we recording? Yeah, we are recording. Okay. Steel Eye Wingspan. The extremely sleek XB-68 would have been largely built from steel to soak up the immense heat of flight at Mach 2.4. It was an extremely ambitious design, combining a very high top speed with long range and a beyond state-of-the-art inertial guidance bombing and navigation system. This was pretty advanced stuff for 1954, and it was predicted to take until 1963 to get into operational service. The US Air Force couldn't wait that long and cancelled it in favour of the far more modest Douglas B-66 destroyer. Martin XB-16. Twin boom shake the room. A 5,000 mile range, a 20% greater wingspan than the future B-29, a top speed of 237 miles per hour and the look of an aircraft that was designed by an 11 year old boy. The XB-16 was a 1934 proposal for a heavy bomber for the US Army Air Corps. Like the Mixmaster, it was powered by Allison V1710 liquid-cooled engines. The engines were mounted in an unorthodox push-and-pull tractor and pusher arrangement. The XB-16 was simply too slow and didn't to progress further than some rather exciting blueprints. The US heavy bombers that actually did enter service were all equipped with radial engines. The design bears interesting comparison with two contemporaneous twin boom aircraft, the Grakowski G37 and the Benelli UB14. McDonnell Douglas, General Dynamics A12 Avenger 2. Cheney's salty triangle. In the late 1980s, the US Navy wanted a long range stealthy attack aircraft one that could operate from aircraft carriers. McDonnell Douglas and General Dynamics responded with a radical design, the triangular A-12 Avenger II. The programme went very wrong. With huge technical shortfalls, delays and cost and weight gains, Dick Cheney wanted to know why the project was going so badly and was given answers he did not consider clear or honest enough. And the axe was swung on the Flying Dorito in 1991. The US government was keen for the contractors to pay back the two billion that had been spent on the project, but the contractors had other ideas. A lengthy court case ensued, one that extended into the following millennium. In January 2014, the case was settled with Boeing and General Dynamics agreeing to pay 200 million each to the US Navy. Despite the huge success of the earlier F-4 Phantom II and the F-15 Eagle fighters, the 90s saw MD losing out. In the fighter field, its ATF contender failed to get to the contest finals. It then joined Northrop's YF-23 offering, which lost in the finals to the Lockheed YF-22. MD also failed to win the JSF contract that led to the F-35. In the civil field, its MD-11 was proving disappointing and the A380-like MD-12 proposal was pure pie in the sky. McDonnell Douglas merged with Boeing in August 1997. If anyone benefited from the A-12 fiasco, it was General Electric. The A-12's F-412 turbofan grew into the F-414, which was to power the aircraft that would perform the attack role in the A-12's absence the Super Hornet. The engine would also find gainful employment in the Gripen EF and Korea Aerospace Industries KFX. Northrop XB-35, YB-35, YB-39. Spirited away. Northrop knew how to play the long game. Since the 1940s, they were trying to sell all wing bombers, but it wasn't until the B-2 entered service in 1997 that they saw this dream come true. Northrop's first flying wing bomber was the XYB-35, which coming in at the cusp of the jet age was later re-engined as the jet-powered YB-49. Though jet engines increased speed to a respectable 520 miles per hour, from the B-35's 393 miles per hour. This came at the cost of range, slashing it by half and effectively removing the aircraft from the strategic bomber class. 
Though a promising design with surmountable technical issues, it was cancelled in 1946. The project had eaten over half a billion 1946 dollars, equivalent to around 6.6 .6 billion in modern dollars. Intriguingly, the later B2 was to have an almost identical wingspan, the difference of a matter of inches, and was created with the benefit of flight data from the YB-49. Today, Northrop Grumman is working on a new flying wing design, the B-21 Raider, North American XB-70, Valkyrie, between a Ragnarok and a hard place. Until the late 1950s, everyone knew that each successive generation of bombers was faster and higher flying than the last. They had to be, as the fighters tasked with blowing them out of the sky were getting ever faster and higher flying. The next step was Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, or around 2,000 miles per hour at 75,000 feet. The resultant aircraft was arguably the most impressive machine that ever flew. A sleek 56 meter long white dart with a delta wing with outer sections that folded down by 65 degrees during a high speed flight. Despite its beauty, the B-70 fleet was designed to annihilate hundreds of thousands of civilians or highly protected nuclear missile silos with free fall nuclear bombs. Despite its beauty, the B-70 fleet was designed to annihilate hundreds of thousands of civilians or highly protected missile silos with free fall nuclear bombs. It was hoped that the bomber's performance would render it invulnerable to manned interception but it was soon clear that ever more potent surface-to-air missiles were a real threat. Intercontinental ballistic missiles were the future, but the XB-70 project had momentum. The XB-70 became a political football kicked around by the most powerful men in America, including Nixon, Kennedy and McNamara, all adopting pro or anti positions as suited their needs. Kennedy was pro B-70 in the 1960 election campaign, but once he won, he changed his mind. The project swung back and forth from bomber to high-speed research aircraft. Lovely. The unusual moniker came from a US Air Force competition to name the B-70, which attracted 20,000 entrants, over 1.5 billion in 1966 dollars, around 12.5 billion in modern dollars, was spent on the XB-70 making it perhaps the most expensive cancelled aircraft project of all time. You're getting very, very slick at the aeroplane reading. <laughs> I, I really do, I don't comprehend what I'm saying. There's something really funny about that. They're probably not brilliant for the narration, but I'm just... It sounds like you do. Okay. I'm going to put that outtake in, in here. With you saying I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>